Hello, today is April 24th, 2009. We're meeting with Mr. Lee Anderson at his home in Fort Collins, Colorado. My name is Brad Hoops. I'm the interviewer for the Northern Colorado Veterans History Project. Welcome, Lee, and uh, thanks for participating in the project today. You're welcome. Let's start out, if we could, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, your date of birth, where you were born, a little bit about your family. All right, I was uh, born in the Roaring Twenties in the land of the sky blue waters, uh, which is Minnesota, in a small uh, community in the western part of the state where I lived for the first 18 years of my life. What, what was the name of the town? Wheaton. What's that? Wheaton. How do you spell that? W-H-E-A-T-O-N, Wheaton. Oh, okay. Wheaton, Minnesota. And uh, just a few miles from South Dakota and a few miles from North Dakota, right at the junction where they're having the floods. Oh, okay, right there on the Red, Red River. River. Anyway, I grew up there, and uh, after I finished high school, uh, <clears throat> which is probably very uneventful, except for me, <laughs> and then, uh, uh, I went to college uh, for a year, and at that time, uh, <clears throat> we lived through the, the Depression years, and uh, the same year I graduated, graduated from high school, uh, World War II uh, for USA began, 1941. Let me uh, just interrupt you real quick and back up a little bit. Do you have many memories of the, of the Depression? and? Any thoughts? Well, uh, particularly uh, as it relates to today. Yeah, yeah right. Well, uh, it was a, an economy that uh, I guess as a 10, 11, 12 year old, uh, we weren't too, we weren't, we were never in a bread line and we never had uh, looking for a place to live or had clothes on our back, fortunately, I guess. Uh, my dad was uh, certainly, uh, he was employed, he was never unemployed, and so. My mother had been a teacher. She had graduated from uh, college, and uh, and then when the, I have a brother, uh, a late brother, and a sister, and uh, she spent most of her energies taking care of the kids. You know? mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. what in those days uh, the the wives didn't work much. <laughs> so, but we had. Uh, I I remember one phrase though. Uh, which has kind of stuck with me through the years, and that is, we can't afford it. <laughs> we can't afford it. So uh, I guess that had uh, My grandfather, who was a retired uh, Lutheran clergyman, uh, lived with us for the last years of his life, too, so he was also an influence in, in growing up in mm -hmm. that part of the world. But it was a, a, a way that uh, I was telling my great grandkids that uh, one of the things when we were young, we would have a larger meal at noon. Uh, that was a custom. And then afterwards, we'd always go to my dad, and he'd give us some money to go to the candy store before we went back to school, because we could always walk to school. You know, mm -hmm. No buses or anything like that. And it used to be nickels. And then it got down to pennies. We get a penny each after. <laughs> I guess that was an uh, indicator that uh, the money wasn't as free as it was at one time. But you know, those were uh, uh, little things that you think of. You know, you went for uh, a treat, and you get a not a quart, but a pint of ice cream to share with. Yeah. Five people, you know, <laughs> a spoonful here, a spoonful there, and I don't know. We, uh, I, I was never really uh, uh, struck by any kind of uh, particular uh, influence that, that caused us any uh, sad moments or depressions. We seemed to be happy and good. Um, I'm okay, and so but I, I, I probably read more about the depressions since I been an adult <laughs> than having lived through it. Is yes, that right? Yeah. 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 So, so you, you said the uh, the war broke out. Uh, had you graduated that spring before or the spring? Okay, so you graduated in the spring of 41. War broke out December uh, 7th. 
Uh, do you remember where you were and what you were thinking when you heard Pearl had been bombed? Yeah, I was at, uh, at Minnesota at university, and uh, I can remember very vividly uh, my roommate and I, who was also from Wheaton, uh, went on to, uh, he became an MD, but anyway, we were sitting in our uh, room study, and, and we were going to take a break and we turned on the radio Sunday afternoon, and uh, uh, we heard this news. George got up and said, oh my God, the Japs are coming and he can still see him. We had Venetian blinds, we used to call them Venetian blinds in the room, and he went and shut them all. He was, he was halfway in jest, but yet. But it didn't really sink in until the next day, and of course, that's when, when uh, uh, the president uh, made his uh, address to the country and, and so forth. But, uh, even then, although the, the events of the world were driven toward our participation in this thing, and then the Japanese attack uh, climaxed the whole experience, uh, we were never too concerned about that, except for one thing. And even then, as I recall, there was what they called the the, the draft, you know, of young men, mm -hmm. not women, but men. So we knew that probably service in the country was inevitable. But even that first year uh, went along. Uh, and then my family uh, moved, uh, migrated in big, big, huge event after living in my family uh, in western Minnesota, they moved to the Portland area. Uh, what took them, took them out there? Well, mostly because of the opportunities for, you know, these small farm communities were uh, <laughs> struggling. And uh, my dad was a, a manager of a, uh, well, it was, Try to explain to the kids like like the Purina Chow uh, seed uh, feed company. Okay. Uh -huh. And that's what he did, and that was supplying farmers uh, seed and and cleaning the uh, monitoring their crop uh, uh, results and things like that. Well, anyway, uh, that was uh, uh, being threatened by the econ economy of the time, and and I had some. My mother had some family in, in Portland, and Portland was just starting to bustle with shipbuilding oh, okay. and all those things that went on like that. So they, I don't think they intended to do anything more than participate in the war effort by by this activity. Well, it ended up they never they never moved back to Minnesota. Mm. So they've lived in, in my younger brother and younger sister uh, grew up there and never left in. But I was kind of, because I had gone to school already in Minnesota, uh, I went back to Minnesota. I never I never lived up there. So anyway, I took a lot of trips on the Great Northern back and forth from, from Minnesota to visit them, but uh, that was the uh, sort of the uh, history of, of my reaction World War II and its uh, beginnings. So they, they moved while you were in college? Uh, no, they moved that summer. Oh, I was, it was a summer. They didn't move until, let's see, the, the, uh, that would have been the summer of 42. They moved in like June and, and I, I moved with them. Oh, okay. I was, I was uh, working uh, as a in a summer job in, uh, in St. Peter, and uh, uh, so I quit that and went back and helped them make the actual move out there. Uh, it took forever, and uh, my dad, well, I don't know what would they be, they were probably in their middle 40s at the time, you know, and they lived, they were both born in Travers County, 
and all us kids were born here. And uh, uh, it was a, quite a, a up, uprooting. Sure. Kind of like the Okies, you know. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Wasn't quite as desperate as that because we, we went with completely without funds. But anyway, then we moved out there, and my aunt and uncle and, and my cousins who lived in Portland area uh, kind of took us in. And uh, at the time was it was just frenzied. I mean, the activity people were moving in from all over the world, well, no, no, all over the country, certainly. Yeah. And they were uh, looking for jobs, and the jobs. I, I got a job. I was only there for three months. And I worked for two of those months, and I framed the first check I got. I couldn't believe it. It made sixty dollars in like a week, and this was <laughs> this is incredible. And I was paying twenty-five dollars a quarter for tuition, you know. <laughs> and now I don't know yeah. fifty thousand dollars a year. <laughs> to go to school, so it was quite a contrast. Uh, but uh, that's, uh, then when fall came, uh, I went back uh, to school, and uh, uh, let's see, that would have been uh, 42, and then in November, I enlisted. Oh, you enlisted, as opposed to uh, waiting to be drafted, were yeah. you? Okay. There was a program, and it was, a. Uh, the Army was soliciting uh, this program, uh, which meant if you enlisted, you were guaranteed to finish your college education before you could call to service. Well, they violated that agreement. And uh, see, from November, when I raised my hand and swore. Uh, I had to pull the Constitution uh, until March, so it was about six, so I got maybe part of a semester in like that. And then in March they called us and uh, we reported to Fort Snelling, and uh, that was uh, the place where we were mustered in, as they called it. And, and uh, without regard to any of your background, you know, everybody. Uh, went in and shipped us off. And I ended up uh, going to uh, uh, Camp Walters, Texas, which is basic infantry training, and it was rough. Yeah, how what, how was that transition from civilian life into military life for you? <laughs> oh, it was rough. It was rough. Uh, I was uh, fairly athletic, and I participated in a lot of sports, and I was in basketball and football and all that stuff. But uh, this training, this physical training, was uh, was an endurance contest. It was 13 weeks, and you know, 18 mile hikes, and uh, and the, uh, the discipline, the regimentation, uh, which is a college kid, uh, you kind of asserted your independence all the time. Well, that didn't, <laughs> that changed, <laughs> and and you didn't you didn't have to think. Uh, that was always easy. You don't have to think, soldier. Uh, the army thinks for you. You just do what you're told. Sort of attitude. Yeah, that was that was difficult. But uh, somehow uh, the Texas uh, uh, environment was was quite a contrast too to the Midwest or even the Pacific Coast. Sure. Uh, we got through it despite the chigger bites and the. <laughs> and the hot temperatures and the full field pack and and all that kind of stuff. And so after a basic, mm, we got to leave and uh, took the train from Fort Worth to way up to Portland to oh see my, my family uh, with the windows down and the soot pouring in from the <laughs> steam engines and we were in a we call them suntans, uh, which is black. But I had, I don't know, two weeks, something like that. And then we went back to, to uh, Camp Boulders, not knowing anything about what our assignments were. <clears throat> we were there for maybe a week or so, and uh, 
we shipped out in various directions, still not knowing where that we were going. And I went to uh, Pennsylvania, uh, across the river from Ohio, Youngstown, in uh, uh, Camp Shenango. And then we were there for a few weeks, still not knowing where we were going. And then we went to Camp Kilmer, New Jersey, and we uh, were there for a couple of weeks. Now, were you assigned in New at this point, or were no, you still moving? No, no, okay, no, no. okay. Unassigned. Okay. Uh, and then we uh, uh, got orders that we were shipping out, and didn't even know we were going. We got on a on a train and ended up in the harbor in New York, and there were the <laughs> ships, and we were on the uh, old converted uh, uh, Normandy, uh, which uh, was a, a troop ship. And we then left in the convoy, and I still have memories of that. One of the things I remember, I, I was something of a jazz fan, still am, and uh, was, one of the attractions at Camp Kilmer was the Glenn Miller Orchestra, which is, we still have Glenn Miller records here, we play occasionally. And that was, that was the, kind of a highlight of, of that experience. But, Anyway, we got on the ships, and we were in a convoy, which we didn't even know what a convoy was, until we got out in the open sea and left the harbor, you know, and saw this, this armada. Oh, it must have been a sight. Oh, it was a sight. And uh, it took us about over 10 days to cross. Well, let me ask you, here's a farm boy from uh, Minnesota. Did you get your sea legs? How did how the crossing good, go for you? Not good. <laughs> we saw we saw a lot of the and the sea wasn't there. The, even at that time of year, it wasn't really too calm, and uh, they would serve you twice a day. You know, this is massive. This was five thousand probably uh, GIs. We got on. I could. Still remember this getting off that train and, and boarding the ship. You had all your gear, your duffel bag, and your backpack. And that was that's that's all the gear you had. There were no foot lockers or anything like that. So and they said, There's your bunk, get in there and they said, Where do we put this? That goes in with you. You know. <laughs> and we I said, Oh God, are we gonna survive this? I had bought uh, at the PX? PX in, in, in Camp Kilmer, a whole box of Hershey chocolate bars. And I don't know, that was an extravagance, I'm sure, but anyway, I had it in my duffel bag, and that's really what I ate, ate on the way over uh, those 10 days. And, and you would cross, it was in a convoy, so you would cross, you crisscross, zigzag, I should say, back and forth. <coughs> and there were times out on the open deck and when, when you were uh, having some nausea, they'd say, well, get up, get up, and get out on the open deck. And you get up there and you see those waves and they come at you and you say, what, what good is this doing? <laughs> this makes me sick, more sick than I ever was. Oh yeah, it was, it was a no pleasure cruise. It was no carnival cruise, I'll tell you. <laughs> We've gone on cruises since several times and they were Quite different. <laughs> so uh, we got there. Was yeah. there any? Once again, uh, on this convoy, I mean, you're you're going through U-boat infested waters. Did you ever worry about, uh, particularly when you're down below deck and your bunk, ever worried about uh, being attacked? Did that play on you at all? Never. Is that right? Yeah. We never had a. I don't know. We were just worry free. I guess it was the age and and uh, camaraderie. Perhaps we were all in there. Yeah, well, there'd be some. Uh, the crack game's going up on, on deck, and you kind of get up there once in a while and shoot a, a little bit, but uh, uh, there was no entertainment or anything like that. You just, you just existed. You swapped a lot of stories for because you had a, a mix of people now that weren't even from your uh, basic training unit, right. you know. You didn't know for no. That's how we got there, and finally we went through the Gibraltar Straits, 
and into the Mediterranean, because we didn't know where we were. Never got any information about destination. Hmm. Like that. And we arrived at Oran. And that was really a revelation, because we were pulling into the docks and we were seeing the Arabs out there on the, on waving at us, and, and it was just a, an experience that uh, was, a, was a, on another world, in another world, well, literally wasn't another right, world. Right, right. And uh, so we were trying to absorb that uh, as we were uh, docking. And then we uh, embarked, disembarked, and uh, landed in, in, in uh, Algiers, Algeria, and then we were transported to what I be became part of my a lexicon, and that was uh, repo depots, replacement depots. And when you weren't assigned, you found yourself in these waiting for assignments. Well, uh, this is where we stayed in in desert bivouac area with ten, ten cities, you know, uh, American, uh, the Army uh, installations. We got there and then got orders to ship out again. Where? Who mm. knew? Mm. The war, see the war now in, in North Africa was just, was must, I can't remember, I think it was almost finished by that time. It was finished by that time, yes. And, and our troops and the Germans and everybody had evacuated. So, uh, they got us on what they called 40 and 8s, uh, which were uh, s uh, single uh, gauge uh, railroads that went all the way across the desert, the Sahara. And we were in there, cramped, literally, sitting with <coughs> our feet touching the feet of our soldier across from us, and just literally down there. And it took us five days to go across. I imagine it, in awful well, conditions as far as heat and, and well, cold at night. And it was agony, and starting for relief calls, <laughs> and <laughs> subsisting on, during that time was our first introduction to uh, field rations, sea rations, which is a, a breakfast, lunch, and dinner packages. Uh, and uh, that's what we subsisted on. But one of, one of the amusing interviews that the kids could get a kick out of when I relate this, we were issued uh, barracks bags. And, duffel bags, and they had the drawstrings on top. And uh, your uh, name and serial number was stenciled on the outside. They would also issue us for some, to this day, unknown reason, mattress covers. I think it was because if you found a place and you found straw, you could get in a bed. Well, anyway. To the GI, that was absolutely useless. Well, what, what, what are we about with these? You imagine these thousands of people on these trains with these mattress covers. So, there were stops along the way, and the uh, the Arabs would always find out with them. So, you'd sell things, or you barter for things. I don't know what they had in exchange. Cause because I never did that. But the funny thing was, we got to one place, and what the Arabs had done, they cut holes in the bottom of the duffel bags and pulled them up as a pantaloon. <laughs> and there was some GI's name across their bottom. <laughs> and the first time we saw this, we got, it was really funny. They had these khaki olive drab uh, fabric, heavy, you know, stuff, and, and uh, there they were out uh, <laughs> parading around in these little villages in, uh, in the Africa. So we got across to uh, Bizerti. Uh, there was a, 
this song during World War II, uh, Gertie from Deserti, uh, you know. And anyway, uh, we were there at a port of uh, a debarkation for a few days. And at that time, unknown to us, we were assigned our units. And I was assigned to the 45th Division. 41st? 45th. 45th Division. Yeah. And uh, the Sicilian campaign was just uh, finishing. And uh, that was in like September, must have been August. Yeah, because my birthday is in August. I don't know. That's the only date I'll mention. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I remember that was, well, I was en route, I think. Uh, so, we were assigned to the uh, 45th, and, and after the ship from Zerdi uh, docked, we had the uh, uh, experience of uh, joining our unit for the first time, and uh, not it's total confusion for us. We didn't know that. We were trained as uh, riflemen and machine gunners and all the heavy arms of uh, semi handy semi-automatic of, of an infantry uh, unit and found ourselves in the Salerno Landing in Italy. That was our my first uh, experience in combat. And again, uh, that was pretty uh, overwhelming. Except we weren't in the first wave, and, and so we didn't have uh, the experience of some of those who uh, preceded us. But that was, I, I had several more amphibious landings after that, but that was the first one. How, how Remember, we're 19, we're, kids are 19 years that's old. That's amazing. How, how was it? I mean, obviously, you guys have been training up to this point. Did training compare anything to the real thing once you... <clears throat> well, I suppose it really did. There were some, some things embedded in your psyche, I suppose, that you picked up in the training that, that paid off. But you, it's, it's hard to pinpoint and say that because this happened, I can relate it to my basic training. Mm -hmm. uh, in basic training, of course, you had firearms, uh, you had to practice on the raids and so forth, and you had to assemble uh, an M1 blindfolded, and you knew the nomenclature of your weapons and all that sort of thing, and, and, and the weapon was your, your friend, your best friend, not your mother or your girl back home or your dog, your weapon was your best friend, mm -hmm. and you slept with it and it carried it at all times, and, and, and that was really probably uh, true. But it was uh, kind of learned uh, by the seat of your pants sort of thing, you know. Except there were some veterans, some of these, we were assigned to this unit which was a National Guard unit from Oklahoma and Colorado and New Mexico. Of course, I knew nothing about Colorado at that time. And uh, they were, I say veterans, they were maybe three, four years older than, than we were, but they were still, they'd been, been there. Can you talk about that relation? I always heard that, you know, the veterans and the, and the replacement, there was always... Conflict? Conflict initially, uh, that they just didn't, because well, there was, was two different psychics and... It was kind of like a used to be in the old days, like a freshman in college, you know, or the, the senior students uh, put you through certain hazing and, and things like that. But uh, actually, I think it was more because you were, they had additional manpower. And uh, regardless of your age or uh, your experience, uh, there was another body there to fill in on patrols and, and things like that. I didn't, I didn't find that. In fact, I thought some of the veterans were turned out to be my best friends. Uh, and they had been in the Guard, you know, civilian life. Many of them were, were 
were even married, you know, not a little, no one in, in our groups were, were wed. Uh, so that was a, they were kind of our mentors, I suppose you would say, in civilian life here. Uh, and, and that was a, that was a good experience. Okay. Okay. And we stayed, we moved progressively up through uh, Italy and into the mountains. And that was a very difficult fall. That, that the rains came and it really rains. And we had no shelter, foxholes. We would go for days and days. Uh, I'd take them up, extra socks and put them underneath. And we wore these OD uniforms, which were cumbersome and they were wool, they were wet, we were wet. It, 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 was just, it was just not a very pleasant existence. How did you manage under those conditions? I mean, you, the awful weather conditions, you probably lack of sleep, food probably wasn't so good. All coupled with the stress of war on top of you. How did how did you, how do you feel? How do you think you made how it through I that? Like that? Yeah. Oh, some miracle. I I, I just don't. I I thought of that a little bit, uh, but I never really really analyzed it. I, I uh, maybe maybe we were fortunate we got through it, but it was miserable. It was not comforting, and there was no uh, hope. You know, sometimes if you're in bad conditions, that there's a, as they say, a light at the end of the tunnel, and you, you know you're going to get there. We didn't know. We didn't know what our objective was. And as we're dog faces in the lowest echelon of of the hierarchy in the army, and uh, communication came down uh, and was not uh, revealing to the extent that the the command staff knew what was going on. And we just followed orders and, and slugged our way and hiked up the, the mountain trails and they were they were rugged. We used we used mule mule packs to carry our food. And we had the same pair of boots, I had the same pair of boots from landing, uh, and we did a lot of walking, a hiking, and, and they were just and your feet were cold, and your socks were wet, and you were wet, and you probably were very disagreeable. <laughs> and you lived uh, in, in uh, essentially, you march as you progressed, whether there'd be an encounter with uh, the enemy, and then you'd dig in, as they say, time to dig in. And of course the soil and the rocks in the, in the mountains in Italy were, you'd have what we call these entrenching tools which you carried them on your back. And uh, that, they were very effective. But, but you dig, somehow dig yourself some kind of shelter because the, the threat was the artillery barrages from the uh, Germans' uh, big guns. And uh, they would burst, and the you know, shrapnel would fly all over, mm. you know, and, and so forth. Well, we went along. I can remember uh, Thanksgiving, which would have been the last part of the November. Of that, and this was was this 40, 43, then was it? Yeah, forty three by that time. And. Uh, it was uh, uh, no turkey with all the trimmings. Uh, uh, I'll tell you, it was a, a kind of a joke among the bivouac. I can remember Thanksgiving <laughs> saying, this is our turkey as we pull out another sea ration. Uh, somehow got through there, and then on December 5th, we got in a barrage that was uh, overwhelming, and that's when I got hit. Can you describe to, to someone like myself or others that will view this that have never been in battle and, and experienced something like that, what, what's that like? Can you visually describe a little bit and then mentally tell us what you're thinking and, and going through is in, in a situation like that? Well, it was frenzy. And it was, uh, 
the uh, here was the possibility. It was quite different, as we talked about our concern in, in the convoys across the ocean. We weren't concerned, but we were concerned here. <laughs> we were being fired at, and we didn't know. We really didn't know if we were going to make it. We we were probably uh, pretty negative about the whole thing. That they're just but sometime there would be a spark that would come through and we say, you know, uh, God willing, I, I'm going to get through this sort of thing. And there's a future out there and all that sort of thing. But those were pretty fleeting uh, thoughts. The thing was, it's a compulsion within a, a human to survive when you're threatened like this. The adrenaline, you know, flows and you say, i got to get through this. Well, sometimes it was so overwhelming you didn't get through it. I mean, you were trapped. And this was a barrage, and I, was, I certainly remember that evening. Uh, it was at nightfall, and, and I felt this in my arm. Uh, well, maybe it was one of the bricks from the uh, foxhole that we tried to build up that had fallen in there, and I kind of, now I felt some moisture. Uh, well, that's not right. <laughs> and this was uh, uh, this was the blood from the wounds. And I got hit on the uh, left uh, here, and I've got wounds all along here. And the shrapnel came in and uh, lodged. And uh, one went through and came out here in the back. Missed the bone, thank God. And then there's a little piece that still had the flake off up here. Well, that's where, that's where I got my uh, disability after the war, was, was from, from, from this, uh, it's really a cosmetic thing. It never had any lingering, but it did bring about a lot of activity right then. And of course, what you could hear after a barrage, which was a real haunting uh, sound, and that was somebody hollering, medic, uh -huh. medic. And you knew uh, uh, somebody was having some real problems. And, and of course, that's what I, I did too. And uh, he crawled over there and, and he said, can you get up? And I said, yeah, I think so. And he said, well, we got to get you out of here. And we had what they call in the uh, battalion aid stations, which were scattered behind the so-called front lines. And that's when we tried to, of course, now we were at elevations. I never did, really, I should check this out sometime and see what the elevation was, because having lived in Colorado and I am more sensitive to elevations, you know, and mm -hmm. mountains and mm -hmm. stuff. I never have done that, but we would have to uh, transcend uh, these, uh, uh, traverse these, these uh, trails, reverse, really. And uh, he said, well, well, can you make it on your own? You do you and I said, no, I, I don't need a litter. And I didn't. In fact, I ended up helping with somebody else as a litter. My arm was dangling there and uh, it wasn't excruciating pain. Do you think adrenaline was playing I, into that or what? I, 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 I never have analyzed it, you know, I thought I'd be just howling and screaming yeah. and I wasn't. It didn't, it didn't, didn't hurt, hit certain nerves, I suppose. That must be the reason for it. So, uh, we got back to the aid station and uh, uh, they stripped everything and treated it uh, at the time with uh, <laughs> band-aids, whatever. No, they didn't want that. But uh, then they put uh, uh, all your possessions in your pocket of your shirt. And I didn't discover this till later. But anyway, then the next in the in the transporting in the logistics of the wounded, uh, you went from the aid station to a general hospital. 
and this was in Naples. Naples had already been uh, taken by the U.S. forces, and the, and the Three Hummus General Hospital was the, the major uh, medical uh, center for uh, the troops, and that's where we were you know, transported. And I ended up in a ward in, in there, and uh, I can remember <clears throat> the orderlies, which were all male, uh, coming around. I said, "There's something," because they had me. By then, they had me strapped with all kinds of uh, uh, bandages and so forth. And I said, something, "Something's tugging at me here." And he says, well, "Why don't you take a look?" They had taken a pin, the safety pin from the bandage right through my skin. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> and I was wondering why this was so tight. And so forth. I thought, my God. He said, what is this? So, you know, in the haste, those out in the field, they were slapping together, you know, as I said, band-aid approach to things sometimes. <laughs> anyway, he removed that, and that was a, a great relief right there. It was a, like we used to call a counter-irritant. You know, it was something you did, you hit your, finger because it felt so good when you stopped, sort of thing. <laughs> anyway, uh, we got through that thing. Then he said, well, here's your effects. And he, he had cut off this, this uh, shirt. And by then we were in hospital gowns, of course. And, and, and so I looked through it. I had a little prayer book. And, uh, and the Upper corner, I still have it, uh, was like uh, it had been gnawed on. And that was a piece of shrapnel that was in that pocket. Isn't that something? Yeah, that was. No, that was a miracle to me. Right, because that would have, location probably would hit your heart. Yep. And uh, there it was. And he said, do you want this? And I said, no, I don't want anything to do with it. I kept the prayer book, but I didn't want the shrapnel want any evidence of that. And uh, that was uh, that was an experience there. Well, I, I was there and had treated. And that was kind of the camaraderie in the, in the, in the uh, hospital ward. Of course, it was, you had a bed. That must have been you nice. You had sheets, yeah. you had food. Yeah. After what we'd been through for several weeks, months, uh, was a, was like a, holiday almost so you had mixed feelings about going to the hospital you know you were had yeah. some treat All right well then they decided that, that they were going to have to skin graft part of this wound take some skin and patch it up that way besides all the suturing that had gone on so uh they prepared for that uh which was a uh, the uh, Pretty easy experience. I mean, there was nothing dramatic about that except what the orderly had done when they went to do the surgery. They looked down and they said, well, where's, where's the graft? And what they did, they call it a, a pinch graft. It was just like, like a thumb. And they take little parts of your thigh, in this case, for here. Well, he was supposed to do it on this one because this is where they are. He had done it over here, and the surgeon was looking for it. He couldn't find. Where is that? Oh, they finally discovered it was. And I had these marks for oh several years. They're gone now. Where they did the pin scrap, hmm. and then they just push it in there and bind it tightly, and let it uh, regenerate into the, into your skin. Remember, this was back when penicillin was just beginning. And I was telling, you know, my wife's going to have surgery in, in a few days down at University Hospital. And she's never, never been in the hospital before. I was telling her about the anesthetic, because she had to go through a pre mm -hmm. And I said, hey, you know, you, you just lie there and you start at 100 and you go to 99, 90, and so and all of a sudden you're gone. And my grandson was there, and um, uh, he, he says, well, what did they, I said, they gave you sodium pentothal. 
Is this sodium pentothal? I said, yeah, that was, they were using it. She said, they used that for truth serum. And I said, no. Uh, well, I didn't even know that then. But anyway, that's what they used. And uh, that's what they did. The, all the surgery I had was under that kind of uh, anesthetic. I stayed there. And the grandest thing that ever happened that in Italy for me was New Year's Eve. And we got these packages from home. And we hadn't heard, and there were, you know, things that your family had said to you, and, and they came in and threw them on each, each bed for those who had it. And so, At this point, was your family aware that you'd been injured and were in the hospital? Had yeah, they, they, word? they, they had, uh, that was, which I knew nothing about until I got, got home, actually, after the war. They, they were sent the wounded in action okay. uh, telegram from the okay. war department, yeah which concerned them, yeah. because they didn't. Yeah, probably yeah. just a simple, no explanation, just wounded. Yeah, yeah. And uh, until I started, was able to write from the hospital, we used email at mm -hmm. that time. That was practically our sole communication link. And that took a while, <clears throat> I'm sure, uh, but uh, the, the, the mail had followed us from our unit, see, the, that had been all sent to our unit. Yeah, how, how, talk a little bit about that uh, before you get into this package. I certainly want to hear that story, but how was communications back and forth at home, particularly when you guys were out in the middle of nowhere? And uh, was was it pretty reliable? Were you getting mail back and forth pretty easily? Or how, well, how would that work? It was very sporadic. Yeah. It was very sporadic. Uh, they knew, they knew my, it was the Company F, 2nd uh, Battalion, 179th Infantry, 45th Division. In, of course, uh, that was my unit for uh, several months, a you know, couple years actually. And <clears throat> they had, uh, uh, they were very good. Oh, I had people writing, uncles and aunts and cousins who <laughs> I rarely saw <laughs> getting letters. In fact, uh, one of the, my aunts who recently died sent me a pack of letters which she had saved, uh, which I have back here uh, from, uh, from those days. So there was communication, but it was very slow, very, the lag, you know, it was days and weeks. It's not like instant message e emails today. No, you yeah. don't email. yeah. no, no follow-ups on your AOL or anything like that. <laughs> it, was, uh, it, was, it was slow, but it was, it was welcome, because mail call was event, I mean, when you got uh, that uh, you, uh, occurring in your, your daily life, it was really nice. So anyway, uh, um, that was a, a Christmas Eve that, uh, uh, and, the, and most of the people in the ward, I'd say maybe there were 10 of us in the ward, five beds, and five across. And so, we were all lying there for so many uh, days that we had this, kind of, we established our own bonding, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and the nurses were uh, great and, and orderlies and everybody was very uh, uh, concerned. They appeared to be, I'm sure they saw so many people, how they could be, but anyway, uh, they had a, by that time, you, I was ambulatory, so I could get up and uh, bathe and, and, and go to the bathroom, go to the mess hall even. Didn't have to wait for the trays to come around. And, uh, so you, you got to move. Uh, so it became a kind of, uh, your, your home, the hospital became your home. And I was there for three, maybe four weeks. Mm. So that was that was, a, that was a nice, in a way, and a, a pleasant experience. It was traumatic in a way, but it was still uh, overall. I think it was more pleasant. Well, <clears throat> then the word came down you were returned to your unit. 
But let's stop, because I interrupted you. You were going to talk about this wonderful package you got. Uh, oh, at, yeah. at, at Christmas, it was actually New Year's Eve. Yeah. Christmas packages was New Year's Eve and, and all, all, mostly treats, you know, goodies and, and things like that. And, uh, there was nothing that they could send that would, there was no clothing or anything like that that you yeah. could use, because during those days, you were in uniform. You didn't. You didn't vary it at all. It was uniform when you were on leave or not. So, uh, but it, it was it, it, I, just the thought that somebody had, yeah. you know, uh, done something for you was, uh, was very uh, uh, neat. So, uh, I went to Mass, Midnight Mass that night, I know that. <laughs> because it was, uh, it was a, uh, an hour of uh, gratitude, I suppose that you had survived. And you didn't really analyze these things. They, they just happened. Yeah, you know, you, yeah. The thing you think about is now, you know, yeah. years later. But uh, that was that was part. And then I went back to my unit. And there they were, the same, minus quite a few. See, another thing that was a, that was a saying in the, the infantry, neighbor, Never make good friends. And that's what I was kind of alluding to earlier with the, with the veterans and the replacements, that, that, that relationship that they, not that there was friction, but, that, but that, that attitude, never make good friends, that they never really befriended you. But. Well, well the, the reason they didn't make good friends is because you lose it. Yeah, you know, yeah. We got it. And, and the rates of the, the, the attrition rate was atrocious, and that was scary because there were people more than I. In fact, one of my, well, that, that was a little later. But anyway, uh, debilitating, you know, where that was the end of their, if it wasn't the end of their life, it was the end of their uh, physical capabilities yeah. to, to serve. But anyway, uh, I got through this, and they thought I was uh, ready to go back to combat. So we, went back and, and they, they were in uh, what they called reserve. In the military, in the infantry, you usually had, at all levels, you had two units on the front and one in reserve. But there was a battalions in reserve, regiments in reserve, companies in reserve. That was the way it worked. This, this my company was in reserve and so they were not under fire, but they were getting ready, the unit was, uh, for a, a major uh, maneuver uh, invasion uh, in Anzio. Okay. And uh, that turned out to be uh, pretty horrendous. Uh, we left then Naples area must have been in in early January, and on ships these uh, uh, landing ship uh, landing ships LSTs tanks landing, landing ship, ship tanks, tanks. tanks yeah and uh, uh, headed you know, Antio wasn't too far from from the Naples area so so that the distance was, was, was not the factor, it was when you came overseas home to the States. And uh, we met, uh, we were no training for this particular landing, and then information, just as you were being assembled in the staging area, that you were going on an amphibious maneuver. We didn't know where, when, or who the enemy was or anything. Well, yeah, well, anyway, we went there and we made the landing. We made the landing on D-Day. That operation was called Husky. And that invasion was a piece of cake. We, we walked right in, you know, and there was no uh, enemy resistance for a while. But then all hell broke loose. And there's been all kinds, of, I've heard, Tons of stuff on the Anzio landing and various other uh, encounters, and the, there was a criticism at the higher levels, uh, which 
because we didn't know what he was about, but that they didn't take advantage of their uh, easy landing and move through up through Rome was the objective, and so they just delayed this, and that gave the Germans an opportunity to reinforce their troops, and they were on a, uh, had an advantage because they were on the hills inland and could look right down on us. They, they could track everything, hospitals, ships coming in, anything in. And so they, they were just, we were sitting targets, you know, sitting ducks and uh, uh, just surviving those things. In the meantime, you were trying to establish your uh, uh, hold on, 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 the, uh, on the ground and progress. And we had some real uh, horrendous experiences. We were, uh, at one point, uh, dug in, I can still remember my, I uh, can't remember his name, but we had a, uh, an outpost, and we looked up and there were uh, German tanks coming mm. in, a, in a, its own armada. And they had uh, troops on the outside. <laughs> oh, this is it. This is not going to last very long. It'll be history. Well, they somehow, the tanks progressed beyond our dug in foxholes to this point, and we were kind of isolated there for a moment. In fact, one of them even ran, ran had the rifle on the outside, which was probably a violation of all <laughs> rules and regulations, but it, it crushed, crushed the, uh, the stock on, on, the, uh, on the... You were that close? At that close. Oh. Boy, you could just, I could just still see, just smell, almost smell the oil. And somehow or other, we, we crawled out of there and got around and went to the, Italy at that point. It's, it's filled with canals. This is the old Mussolini effort to reclaim that part of the country. And we crawled back and got into a canal uh, which had uh, uh, concrete uh, side to it and slipped down there and somehow uh, uh, survived. And f we were without any contact with any unit at all. We were just, not only us in our fox, but some others had similar experiences and we were all there uh, not, not knowing where we were going or anything, but somehow we got back to our unit and that's where we were ready for another onslaught and assembled and were given all kinds of briefings and we did several patrols. We'd send patrols out at night, you know, which is also uh, kind of scary. Uh, but we got back and then we had a big barrage and uh, another one and that's when I got hit in the right occipital area right up here in my head. I had my helmet on, fortunately. It was a big slash in the helmet, jagged, and uh, knocked me out. And, and fortunately, the, the wound was really superficial, you know, but uh, scary. And of course, there's a, anything with the head, there's a, the brain is always a, a factor of concern, and, and so. <clears throat> They sh shipped me out, and I left Anzio on the uh, ship back to Naples, back to the same hospital I'd been in a few weeks before. <laughs> and I just was there and kind of under observation, more or less, or anything, because there was nothing we didn't do. It. We, I don't even know if they had brain scans in. Uh, mm -hmm. Certainly, like I just paid for one and. <laughs> They're pretty expensive here. But uh, anyway, uh, they decided that rather than send me back right away, they would give me temporary duty. Well, I mentioned repo depots, and one of the repo depots in, 
in Italy was at an abandoned racetrack. And uh, that's where they would assign uh, students, students, uh, soldiers waiting to go back to their units or reassigned, whatever. And they gave me a job in the post office. So I, I spent about, oh, three, four weeks, I guess, sorting mail. I don't know anything about this. But anyway, it was, again, you had your own uh, tent with six or eight other guys, and you had a mess hall and so forth. And, and you had clothes and you were wet and you were dry and so forth. And then they had entertainment at this place. And that was fun because we, we saw several touring USO. Uh, Danny Thomas, who mm. was just starting in his career. And uh, Marlena Dietrich, who played the saw. <laughs> and things like that. And then they had several uh, uh, Variety shows, you know, and, and that, that was that was fun. Uh, I can remember once uh, uh, Irving Berlin, who had a, had a big uh, uh, U.S. What do you call it? I can't remember his name now, but it was a big show that he auditioned uh, uh, on their uh, for its run on Broadway in in overseas. Uh, uh, venues, and uh, uh, this was, he was playing, uh, what was it, one of his, one of his tunes, well the, the co commandant of the camp was a colonel, a, a bird or a colonel, that came out there afterwards and he, he uh, thanked him for coming and so forth, and said, would he make one, one request and <coughs> Uh, Mr. Berlin says, well, certainly, what would you like? He said, could you play uh, one of your, your favorite, one of my favorite tunes that you wrote? And he said, sure. And uh, he said, well, what was that? And he said, Yankee Doodle Dandy. And Mr. Berlin looked at him and he says, well, sir, he says, that was George Cohan's tune. It wasn't mine. <laughs> And all the GIs just howled. Here's a curl that screwed up, you know, in front of everybody. <laughs> that was kind of funny. And uh, anyway, but he played Yankee Doodle anyway. <laughs> so, so anyway, we had uh, those kinds of experiences. Well, by this time, uh, they were, the, my, I'd been rehabilitated, I guess and fit for service again and uh, sent back to the, the unit. And they were in training. The 45th was, was drawn from, and we were training down in the Paston area out here uh, between Salerno and Naples. And so we were there for uh, quite a few, must have been four or five weeks doing amphibious maneuvers uh, not knowing yeah, why, right. but uh, so we had a chance for a few leaves and could get into Naples and had a little R and R and, and uh, saw a little bit, learned how to. The trains were starting to come back into use. You know the, the public transportation got around to Pompeii and places like uh, that. Wow. And at the time, Vesuvius was erupting. Really? Yes, I have some pictures of it. And uh, that was back in 40, what was it, 44, yeah, I guess so. Well, <clears throat> we trained, and the next amphibious landing was in southern France. So that was a, a little slower convoy because we went up through the, uh, and that was in August, uh, August of 44, I guess. And, uh, that landing was uh, uh, another uh, relatively easy, easy one. There was not much resistance. <clears throat> and then we got 
kind of fancy. And we were going up the, uh, the countryside, up through the Rome uh, River Valley. We landed down there <clears throat> between Marseille and, and uh, Toulon, I think it was Toulouse, Toulon. <coughs> and uh, we got up into the uh, uh, a little head of ourselves, and uh, we were on a, on a patrol. And it, was, it was quite a, quite a large one, it was jewelry company size. And we got cut off. Ooh. And there we were surrounded by Germans. Well, there was not a chance we were going to get out of that. So they came in, and we had no other choice, and so they captured us. And we were uh, in a position where, where we thought, are they going to send us back to a, a prison camp or are they going to do, you know, chop off our heads or what are they going to do? But what they did was they were in a retreat. We call it strategic withdrawal. We don't use the word retreat. But anyway, they were in a retreat, and it was <laughs> unbelievable. I got some stories from the Stars and Stripes about this experience that we were in, and it, it was just bedlam. They were commandeering any kind of mode of transportation they could, and just going in reverse up uh, the river uh, north in France. <clears throat> but they didn't know what, what to do with us, so they assigned three German uh, guards to this American contingent, and I said I think it was twenty-five or thirty of us. So they tried to uh, figure out a way to get us back, and I'm sure that was the destination was to get us back into into Germany or into some kind of a stalag. But uh, they, they were having a terrible time, and we were going through Lyon. At the time, we were blowing up bridges, and, and uh, oh, we got caught in one shattering of uh, glass from from buildings, and fortunately, no one was was injured. We were, as we were retreating with these three Germans, uh, mostly walking, sometimes commandeering a vehicle, and that would usually go for a few miles and then break down, or the tires would uh, deflate, or something would happen and we kept going. It was, it was desperate, so uh, they uh, said, well, let's veer off the, and they found this uh, <clears throat> chateau, I guess, in near the Swiss border. And so they said, well, well, we'll stay here for a while, we'll hold up here. So here's the three cards. And one of them spoke very English very well, so there was no communication problem. And uh, they knew their situation was desperate. And we knew that their situation was desperate too because there was no way we were going to survive this. So we talked them into surrendering their arms, and they came with us. <laughs> yes, right. And we were in this chateau, and this German Swiss slash uh, caretaker heard this, this, uh, these voices, and of course he thought it was the enemy. And at the time, the important part of the uh, French uh, resistance was the FFE, the Free French, and they were kind of a renegade outfit from civilian. Uh, who would participate in these uh, clandestine <laughs> activities and <laughs> follow up the Germans every time they could. Well, they thought it was, so the FFE attacked us in, in this uh, chateau. And, <laughs> oh, geez, we can't win for losing here. <laughs> and we finally said, America, America, America. 
and we somehow communicated with them. And then they realized who we were, and then they embraced us and hugged us and kissed us and everything. <laughs> oh, it was it was crazy. It was crazy. These three Germans just sitting there in the side. They thought, oh good, they're going to get us now. Well, we had to we had to almost fight to protect them. And because we were dead to them too, in a way, it was a, yeah. it was kind of a cross feelings. And well, we finally were released and found our directions back to our unit <coughs> with the Germans, and then we turned them over to somebody. I never did find that out. Well, that made quite a story. We had the Stars and Stripes reporters come out and interview us. And, really? You know, yeah. We, we felt like we were celebrities. And, we didn't do much with the escape. Well, I stayed with the, the unit then up into the uh, Vosges Mountains for a while, and then my feet really started to kick up on me. And I was really s suffering from what they called trench foot. Mm. You know, my feet lost their circulation. They were frozen. And from all that exposure for the past several months, Coupled with the fact, I believe that was one of the worst winters Europe had gone through. And that yeah, that winter was because later on, of course, it was the Battle of Bastogne and, yeah. and so forth, which was in, in December. And this was in would have been Atlanta in August, September, September, early October. Oh, okay. Something in that, uh -huh. time. but it was still cold yeah, up yeah. there, really cold. So they sent me back uh, to another hospital. Bessasson, and uh, I was there, and, and uh, <laughs> this group, you'd see that we were all soaking in, in these tubs with purple promalgamate, and <laughs> everybody's ankles down through the foot were all purple, and so there were just scores of GIs who, it was, it was really debilitating. Well. They finally reclassified me, which is a pretty happy day. I didn't know where I was going, but I knew I wasn't going back in any more combat. So uh, we hung around there and finally got assigned. Uh, by that time, I made a couple stripes, and I thought, well, I don't know what. I was a sergeant then, and uh, thought, I don't know what they're going to do it. I don't have any real skills that can apply well. They found a place in Supreme Headquarters. So they sent us from Bessensloh uh, back to Versailles. <coughs> and so the last, I got there, must have been, what, November then, to Versailles. And I was there in this unit they call it quartering and accommodations. And they said, well, you've got some management, you must have some management skills. You've had a few semesters with college and you've done this and you you were a squad leader and all that. So, forth. so you're going to be in this unit. And what our responsibility was to find appropriate quarters for general officers which means you would go around and you would look for, in France it was Chateau, and then we got, in Germany it was castles, and you'd go out and you'd observe uh, what would be appropriate, and uh, you could then rehabilitate them to standards that would be acceptable to, to the general and his staff. Well, <laughs> That was, a, that was okay with me. We had a, a quarters there that were very uh, commodious by comparison, and there was a, a good good mess. Well, then I got the unit was moving because Schaefer was uh, transferring them up to Res, or Reims, as they call it, and that's where uh, I was then assigned. So we uh, relocated up there, and I was there for, oh, several weeks, and, and that was, that was a good dude, because we would uh, <clears throat> have 
responsibility of recruiting the local uh, workforce, which were usually old people and young people and nobody in between, to help uh, rehabilitate or clean up these these quarters. And so that, that's what we did. Then we also had, it was like a hotel, really, for uh, non-general officers, or troops, really, not just officers. And uh, we would have uh, uh, vacated hotels. The, the practice was that anything that Germans had occupied was free for the enemy to take over. Because they occupied about everything. Yeah. So you had the license to go in and uh, take over these all, all the way from small hotels to, to large high rises. Well, they, in Rams, they weren't too high, maybe seven, eight stories, something like that. And, and that's what we did. And then we had the uh, uh, next move when Schaaf moved to Frankfurt, to Germany. So I took part of that you know, uh, contingent, and I was among them, and I had a, then a few people under me, and we uh, flew. It was the first time we'd been in, in, an, air, in an army or a military plane. We flew from, uh, uh, actually back to Paris, we went, on, on, and then flew from Paris up to Frankfurt. And there's where we took over. Now that was a different conditions completely because Frankfurt had been pulverized. Mm. And so we didn't even know how to go about that. Well, what we did was we'd fly over Frankfurt in Piper Cubs to see if wow. we could spy, spot uh, places that could be used for quarters. And, and there were some nice <laughs> castles in in Germany, uh, where uh, uh, we actually would identify, and then we would uh, pinpoint those, and uh, that would be where we'd go for uh, uh, reha rehabbing those, and we'd, we'd, we'd have to hire local uh, ladies, Putzfrau. Wie heißen sie Put? Wie heißen sie Fräulein? Uh, 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 we, got, we got some phrases we would use to, to recruit them and, and, you know, they were so grateful to have something to do because they got a meal out of it. And, and we then had uh, the, the staff, uh, the, the, the buildings for the headquarters were the Ige Farben industry. And, Speaking of pinpoint bombing, they had preserved that. There wasn't a brick out of place in that huge structure. Mm. And then all the uh, uh, surrounding uh, uh, quarters for, for work people for the EGA Farben were now ours. And that's where our staff each had our own apartment. Imagine that. What, what we needed an apartment for. Then we had transportation to the mess, and, and that's where I was from up through. I know FDR died, and the war was over in May. And uh, up, uh, you're now in Frankfurt, um, and you had heard word. I think we left off. You had heard word that uh, Roosevelt had died. Uh, yes, that was uh, what March, mm -hmm. perhaps forty-five, something like that. And right, that was a very sobering experience, even for the GIs, and it's a distance. But uh, then uh, the negotiations for uh, uh, termination, secession of, of hostilities had begun. And then they were back in, 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 in Reyes, I know a lot, because of the so-called uh, schoolhouse where the uh, surrender uh, uh, was uh, was the venue for the surrender. We had rehabilitated that place earlier. But we were, as I say, we were in Frankfurt, and we had uh, uh, responsibility for uh, 
some of the uh, visiting dignitaries, I guess you'd say, uh, who came into to Frankfurt at, at that point. Uh, then after the uh, VE day, uh, then they had some of the post uh, war conferences. One was more famous at Potsdam in, in Germany, and we sent a team up there to prepare uh, quarters for them. I didn't go on that particular junket, but um, they came back with a, uh, that was the first time we had, had encounters with the Russians, mm -hmm. <coughs> which was an interesting experience. And they would give you anything for, any, like your wristwatch, you know. Uh, <laughs> because they, they were just short of all that sort of thing. Well, anyway, there was a new one. And then we, we got through, the, the summer was uh, uh, relatively low key. And then uh, the concentration was in the Pacific. And of course, uh, the, the bomb was the next uh, thing. Well, from some of the distance, we were you know, avid readers of Stars and Stripes, you know, it was kept up to date pretty well. Uh, and then after, after VJ Day, then within days, the Army had calculated a point system. Mm -hmm. You've probably heard of that, and that was based on the number of years in service, your overseas assignments, uh, whether you've been in combat, and... Uh, Which are... In your case, your injuries, would that have gained you points as well? Oh, yeah. Well, because you had the Purple Heart. Yeah. I had two Purple Hearts. Yes. Yeah. And, and uh, in addition to the Bronze Star, I had the Combat Infantryman, Bad CIB, and so all that was put into some kind of a mix. And so I had points that went off the scale, you know, not any doubt that I would be in, in an early uh, re, uh, return contingent, and it, it came within maybe 10 days after VJ Day. I got my orders that I had qualified to be uh, released, and so uh, then we, we left uh, my unit in Frankfurt and went by train to Le Havre and uh, hung out there for about a week before we get ships to come back to the States. And we came back then on a Liberty ship. They aren't the most seaworthy uh, of all <laughs> vessels. <laughs> so it was a pretty rough, rough cruise, but we were so thankful we were heading in the direction that we did. So we landed in Boston had a big welcoming uh, as as we came into the harbor with the uh, fire truck, uh, fire uh, boats out there, and then big streams going up, and music and uh, things like that. And then we went to Miles Standish uh, in Bo outside of Boston, and that's where I got transportation, and because my family had moved. Uh, I was uh, sent to Port Louis, Washington, way across. And on the trains in 45, uh, it was pretty slow going. Uh, but I got to Port Louis. And see, I had never spent much time in, in, uh, out there with, with the family because I was gone, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. as they were establishing themselves. Mm -hmm. So it was a, a new world in, in a way, and a new house. I'd never seen, by that time they had their own house, and, and that, that was all, it was all new. So um, I got to, to Port Louis, and they gave you leave practically right away. So I went down and uh, by a bus and got into their uh, about one in the morning, something like that, and I didn't know where the hell I was. And I got a cab and 
he drove me out to this address and and uh, did, did they know you were coming? Were you even, okay? <laughs> oh, wow. What were you doing? Wow. Uh, there was there was so much so everything was so fast. Yeah. I didn't, I, I didn't even uh, have a chance to telephone them. Okay. So I knock on the door about two in the morning and shock the daylights out of them. And there I stood, hadn't seen them for nearly three years. Wow. And that was quite a reunion. I'll bet. Yeah. My dad, uh, my sister, uh, my brother was out. He, he's a jazz musician. He was out on a gig, so he did, these hours were familiar to him. <laughs> he kept wandering in, wondering where all this was going on. So anyway, uh, then I went back. I had to go back to do all the uh, follow-up stuff at Fort Lewis. And so I was back there for a couple more days. And then on October 1st, 1945, I was honorably discharged. The Army of the United States. Uh, that was the end of my career. Did uh, uh, getting back to the home front after the war? Did did your folks ever talk about how they were feeling this whole time uh, with you in harm's way? And did they ever discuss that at all? How they dealt with that? And, uh, you know, well, with your uh, injuries and and uh, getting these very simple. Wounded in action telegrams with no information, and did no. they ever talk about their feelings about uh, how they dealt with that, or, uh, or, or we we didn't uh, not in depth. Yeah, I think uh, initially uh, because I didn't stay around there long, you know, to to absorb this. Because after I I got there, I spent a few weeks with them, and I went back to the Twin Cities to reestablished my contacts there and then I went back again in it would have been December of 45 to uh, to Washington Oregon and I was there uh, just during the holidays and then went back to school enrolled back in Minnesota yeah okay and there's uh, Except for the holidays, I'd go back and forth, and, and sometimes they, they came out to see me. And then, then my brother moved out with us for a while, with me for a while, and he went to, to school music there. And uh, <clears throat> then I went, uh, I met this lady, uh, this beautiful young girl, actually. In, uh, in class in Minnesota, and we stuck stuck up a relationship, and uh, two years later we were married. And I was at the time uh, I, I left Minnesota, and I had a, a position at Iowa State at Ames. And uh, then we went, we were married in St. Paul, and then we went to graduate school at Illinois, and that's where I went on and got my graduate degrees. So uh, we lived in uh, Champaign-Urbana for that first year, and then, then I, I, I got an assignment at the University in, in Chicago. So we lived in Chicago for six years. And that's where our first uh, daughter came along, and uh, uh, we started answering some inquiries that came in my field. And, uh, what, what was your field? Wait. In information science, okay. uh, libraries. Okay. And uh, so I uh, uh, had gone some interviews and so forth, and then this uh, opportunity that came out here at, at, at CSU, which was just becoming CSU. In fact, it became CSU the first day I reported for duty. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> 1957. <laughs> and uh, I was the director here, became, de became dean, and then uh, I was here for 28 years. Hmm. And our second daughter came along, and uh, they, between the two of them, produced 
five grandchildren, and our older daughter is in, uh, we were just having this fire in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Right. Well, that's where she lives. Oh, jeez. My grandson, who just graduated from Clemson, is, is there too, and I talked to him on the phone last night. He was like, cool. And then our younger, uh, our older daughter had uh, uh, three kids. The oldest one is just driving, is just flying out there. He's now with the CIA and has been, he's going back to Baghdad for his, I think it's 15th, 15th trip back there. How do, how do you feel as a, as a, from a grandfather's standpoint, that's been in, 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 combat action or in a combat zone. How do you feel from your perspective now to see him going over there? Does Uneasy. Yeah. <laughs> but, well, that kid, you know, he's, I say kid, he's 34 years old, but uh, he's he went through uh, Benning, the jump school, intelligence school, special, he's in special forces. Uh, he, he's done all that and besides College uh, courses here and there. He never was a full-time resident, a college student. He was always interrupted by this or that or the other. But uh, he's on his special assignment now, and of course uh, he's he's uh, running the whole Iraqi operation for the unit, and his headquarters is in the airport, and he has field units all over. The the country and he flies in helicopters to check up on him and uh, but he's been on the mission things and, and all kinds of uh, under underground stuff and he, he, he can't talk too much about it sure. but I know it's been hazardous it's less hazardous as the years go by but it, it is still what is it, five six years something like that uh, it's uh, it's a uneasy life, and he just they have uh, uh, they live here, he keeps his headquarters here, uh, and uh, his wife uh, went through and got her degree in accounting, and they have a three year old who's a delight. Yeah. So you're four, four great grandchildren. Great four great grandchildren, <laughs> <laughs> and they're all a real. <laughs> challenge yeah. for them I'm sure that they're delight for us but it, <laughs> so and then uh, our, our granddaughter has three three boys they've all boys no, no granddaughters and so forth <laughs> and then our, our, our youngest grandchildren uh, they're living this year with my my daughter and their, mother, their father split, divorced. My daughter's a, uh, a nurse, a CU graduate. And uh, uh, anyway, they, 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 one of them is a senior in high school, and one of them is, what, Lauren must be like the 10th, 9th grade, I guess. So they're still coming along. There's two, kind of two separate families. Uh -huh. But uh, we see them well, often enough. <laughs> That's what my wife says. <laughs> oh, anyway. So, how many years have you guys been married then? It's on June second. It'll be fifty-nine. Wow. Yeah, nineteen fifty. It's easy to calculate. We were married in nineteen fifty. And on the Hamlin, she's she's a librarian. She's she's a librarian at the University, uh, Hamlin University, and and she was librarian at Chicago Public Library the years I was at the university. Uh, and then she, when we moved out here, then uh, she had, uh, she, she always says, I'm unemployed. And I said, no, you're not unemployed, you're retired. <laughs> 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 huh. Yeah. So anyway. Well, Lee, we'll start to uh, wind down this uh, interview. 
Is there anything I didn't ask you that you wanted to talk about or any stories you can think of now that you remember that we've left out that you want to talk about so we can fill out this interview as best we can with everything? Or did we cover everything, do you think? Seems like I've been talking forever. We must have covered everything. Yeah, good. It was a, because I, in retrospect, you know, uh, not as far as a lifetime concerned, but, you know, I'm 85. Uh, it was a relatively small part of your life. Well, that's always my, uh, one of my last questions as well, then, too. We'll lead into that. How do you think that period of your life played a role in your, your life, changed your life, affected your life, or was it just simply just a chapter in your life that you went through? No. Well, it was a chapter, but it was a very influential chapter. There's no doubt about it. It gave me, my experience gave me a, a, a sense of a focus, I think, uh, when you're an 18, 19 year old college student, you're, I, I don't think it's changed much, but uh, you know, the future is something you don't know, worry about. But coming back and going to school after the war as a GI, uh, it was a, a, a different experience and a, a sense of, of uh, what I really wanted to do and what was my values. My values probably were altered and uh, established, and indeed my philosophy of life, probably. So yes, it was uh, it was important, it was critical as I look back, and, and uh, I'm sure helped me uh, to become whoever I am uh, later on. Even though at the at the early uh, separation from the military, you just want to forget about a lot of that. Yeah. You, know, you, you weren't in the mood to discuss it, but as you, as you reflect and you realize that uh, it's embedded in your psyche so that, uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a, a good thing that happened to me as, a, as well as a, it was the good and the bad, you know. Yeah. The bad and the ugly. Over, over the years, did you keep in touch with anybody in the army, or go to any sort of reunions or anything like that? Well, uh, interestingly, no, not much until I read, and I, this is a reestablishment. I read uh, a story about Anzio, and the interviewer, who is this historian, uh, had quoted several persons, and he had a index of the interviewees and among them was this one name uh, nobody there aren't many Ladoos in the world and this was my platoon leader at Anzio and I thought could that be Bob Ledoux which was Lieutenant Ledoux to me then and so I uh, went back and I reread all the times he was quoted, and I was on every single thing that he mentioned in this book. Hmm. And I got, this was, this was only two or three years ago, so I got really almost excited about this. I said, how am I going to get in touch with him? So I found out he was a veterinarian. He became a veterinarian. And so I uh, contacted uh, the uh, American uh, Veterinary Association and found he was a member and listed and his address was there. So I wrote to him. Just started out by saying, Dear Lieutenant, you probably don't remember me, <laughs> but I was in Company F and so forth. And I was at Angio and so forth. And less than a week later I got a handwritten letter back from him, and it was in, in, in longhand, and uh, uh, he started off by saying, of course I remember you. And so uh, he was in the, he got wounded at, at Anzio also. I mean, he was really uh, uh, seriously, severely wounded, and he was discharged because he had all kinds of 
intro to flicks and stuff like that. And an interesting little interlude or well, part of his life was he married one of the nurses at the 300th General Hospital huh. from Naples. And uh, so they had a life together. And so since then, we've been corresponding and talking and sending pictures and stuff like that. And so he's, in, he's retired and lives in North Carolina. He wants to get together with my daughter. Of course, she's in South Carolina. I don't know if that'll ever happen. Yeah. He's, God, he's, I shouldn't say he's thriving, uh, but he's, uh, he's three years, at least three years older than I am. He's pushing 90. And uh, he went through, came back, G.I. Bill went through vet school and practiced medicine, taught a little bit, and went to Michigan State. And so that was an interesting story, and I gave him my story. Yeah, yeah. So that's, that's really the only, uh, I, I see the names, and I, I, I just, they, they're just fleeting. They yeah, mean, sure. Uh, not, not really, but, but the Bob Widu is, is uh, I, one contact, and I'm glad we have that. So wonderful. Well, we'll close her down, Lee. Uh, is there any closing statement you'd like to make uh, to those that uh, will see this tape in the future uh, to close to round out the interview, or or not? Well, no, except it was a it was a uh, a part of world history, which was uh, uh, interesting to be a part of uh, that. Those particular years were influenced uh, not only our lives but uh, the shape of the world, and uh, uh, I guess that's that's important to to understand and realize that. That's right. So, that's right. thank you. Well, I want to thank you for for uh, once again for sitting down to tell your story today. But uh, more importantly, I want to thank you for your service to our country. You're welcome. This is the Purple Heart, which is given for uh, wounds in action. Now, you, you would have gotten two. Is that that yeah. little? Okay. That's the oak leaf called the oak leaf cluster. Signifying that you got two of them? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's the second one. Okay. In, in lieu of the first. Uh huh. Bronze Star is for, um, I don't know, bravery, whatever. Uh, the uh, It's it's a medal that that several have achieved. This is a uh, particularly prominent one called the Good Conduct Medal. <laughs> that means you've never gotten in the brig or in the, <laughs> in the, in the jail. Uh, this is the German Occupation Medal. This is the uh, World War II Medal. This is the so-called ETO, the European theater of operations and that five that silver star are the campaigns that I went that I had during uh, that uh, and you were in five campaigns six actually, six because okay. there's another bronze one on the side there. okay five silver ones six ones and so forth uh, I don't know what else I can show you uh, you know uh, Talk a little bit about this picture when it was taken and such. Do you remember? Oh, that, well, that was after, uh, just at the tail end of my service. Uh, here's the sheaf patch over here. Then, as the custom is, you wear the uh, unit before on your on your right shoulder, and picture the blouse. The if you'd thing. like, sure. I don't. I don't know. <laughs> Let me see. You probably can't see it. Okay, so you still have your blouse, and mm -hmm. I'd never fit into the trousers. I'm sure. Of that. <laughs> and it, you this is to... the discharge. That's that's we used to call it the ruptured duck. That everybody who'd been in the service, and you you wore those uh, on your civilian clothes too. And I suppose I have one someplace. Uh, that's just a, a a replication of the. I've got a board that I'm supposed to put this on so it evens them out a bit. That's the same that you saw on the... Well, now, the uh, the upper 
uh, metal. That's a that's a marksman's. Uh, isn't that that's no, a pretty no. a pretty prominent. Uh, no, it's not marksman. It's the CIB. It's the Combat Infantryman's Badge, and that's that's a very special. Yes, award. exactly. Yeah, uh, and also made. Turn, turn it a little bit more to the light. Let's see if we can get. Gave us ten dollars more a month. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's a, a pretty significant uh, uh, medal to earn, right, from what I understand. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I got a whole story about the CIB, which a lot of people do. And I've got a decal in the, in the back windshield of my car. And I have, as a tennis, one of the things I was a very, until last year was a constant in my life, was tennis. And among my tennis buddies, they would ask about this, so I researched the CIV and provided them each with a, with a breakdown of what it is and how it started and how they established it and so forth. Huh. Yeah. And then uh, the patch on your on your shoulder here? That's the chief. That's Supreme Headquarters patch. Wow. Uh, that was the last unit I was uh -huh. with, see. And, and as I say, the uh, this was the one I was with. On my, most of my career, 45th Division. The Thunderbirds. Very good. That's it.